Support for this program comes from our members. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the 2015 Bloomington Democratic Mayoral Debate. One of these three candidates will be chosen May 5th to run in November's general election with Republican candidate John Turnbull. The rules of this debate are simple. The candidate first posed a question will have up to 90 seconds to respond. The other candidates will have 60 seconds to rebut, with 30 seconds for the first candidate to comment. There will be two-minute opening and closing statements for each candidate. Community members submitted the majority of the questions that will be asked tonight. And we will continue to take questions throughout the debate as time permits. So please email your questions to news at indianapublicmedia.org or call 1-800-987-9848. The candidates are John Hamilton, Daryl Neer, and John Linnemeyer. John Hamilton was chosen by a coin toss to go first. Mr. Hamilton, you may now begin your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for having this debate. I want to thank my fellow candidates for being part of this campaign, which has been an excellent campaign uh, with good debates. We've had several, and it's uh, exciting to have one again, and I appreciate everyone being here to listen in. You never know what you'll hear in debates, so we look forward to that, but I am sure that they will help Bloomington decide the race. It's a good thing that we get together and talk about how to make Bloomington together, uh, work together, and I'm also sure we'll all pull together after it's over uh, to work together. But you, you do need to decide uh, about this election, and let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a native Bloomingtonian, born here. My wife and I have raised our kids here now. And uh, they learned to ride the bike, uh, their bikes in the same place that I did, walk the same streets uh, that I walked. We love the city of Bloomington, of course, its quality of life, uh, the arts, the parks, the festivals, the bike lanes, even bike races coming up this weekend, uh, and uh, trees, cafes, and there are things we need to keep working on. More good jobs, more affordable housing, more accountable government and an openness to all in the community. It's not automatic that we'll keep getting better, uh, but I'm confident that we can with good decisions. I am pleased to bring experienced leadership to the job. I look forward to that. Uh, and proven 30-year progressive values and a record of results. Uh, I really appreciate your attention here tonight. I look forward to the discussion and debate uh, and would ask, uh, as John Hamilton, I'd request your vote any time between now and 6 p.m. May 5th. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Neer. I genuinely want to bring new ideas and new energy to the office of the mayor. I know Bloomington well, and I've lived many different lives here. I've lived the life of a student and an hourly employee working at Blooming Foods and Hoosier Outdoor Advertising. I've been fortunate to be a member of the IU faculty for nearly 20 years. I've been volunteering for Monroe County Youth Football, the Bloomington Animal Shelter, Martha's House, the Boys and Girls Club, and the MCCSC Foundation Steering Committee. I know Bloomington well from my nearly 15 years of public affairs programming and TV, on radio and TV, engaging with the issues and the leaders throughout our community and region who impact our city. And I know Bloomington through my leadership on the Bloomington City Council our local legislative body where I served as president in years 2013 and 2014. The same legislative body from which many of our past mayors also learned the laws, peoples, and policies that made them successful in office. And I'm known in many of my roles throughout Bloomington as a good listener, someone who does their homework, and considers multiple perspectives to decide the actions that best serve the city that we love. And throughout this campaign, I've been talking about five issues. And I'm getting the basics right. And that means delivering the essential city services that you come to expect, as well as holding us accountable and further building public trust. It's also about growing and protecting a sustainable economy that works for everyone. Preserving the unique character of our downtown neighborhoods, downtown and neighborhoods, and creating a culture of openness, transparency, 
and engagement. And what was really makes me happy in this, this debate and these conversations, we've all been talking about how do we collaboratively work on addressing the issues of homelessness within our community. So I hope that I can earn your support tonight and throughout the rest of this campaign and earn your vote on May 5th. Thank you, Mr. Lennemeyer. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I have a certain vision for Bloomington that uh, uh, primary thing I'd like to do is to restore trust in local government. I think that's crucial and I'm afraid that we've slipped on that. Uh, I, when I see the switchyard uh, parks there, I see tremendous potential. I'd like to turn that into something world class like the Missouri Botanical Gardens. I'd like to see rails to trails go down I used to uh, ride on freight trains, and I'll tell you, it's beautiful going down uh, past the uh, bluffs, cedar bluffs, along Clear Creek, over the trestles, uh, down through Bedford, straight down to the Ohio. Uh, I'd like to see Bloomington lead, not just follow. And I feel uh, one thing that most people seem to be in favor of is decriminalizing marijuana. Well, why the heck aren't we doing it? We could uh, turn it into a $5 fine, direct the police to uh, uh, give us those citations, and uh, I, th I think uh, that would be a tremendous example to, uh, to other towns, and uh, so I think we should go in that direction. As far as the deer, there's no time to get into it. I've got a plan. It's non-lethal. It's going to work. I'm tired of having this thing kicked down the road. As far as homelessness, I actually have a bit of a different uh, take on it. I don't think we've asked enough of our, our uh, homeless population. It's not just a matter of, uh, okay, first off, nobody should go hungry. Nobody should go without shelter and children should be taken care of. But uh, we're down to four seconds. I hope we get to revisit that issue. Okay, thank you very much. Well, let's get to it. Our first question, we've had several residents ask us about public trust. Uh, last year, city officials discovered a Bloomington senior project manager was working with two men from a concrete company to embezzle hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's another instance uh, this year from a city office manager who faces federal charges for stealing public money. So the question is, what measures do you plan to take to restore public trust and ensure that taxpayer money is being spent appropriately? Mr. Hamilton, uh, you begin with 90 seconds. I'm a progressive and I love government. We got to make it work right. I've run two large state agencies in my career for Governor O'Bannon, 1,000 people and 10,000 people, a $6 billion budget. I know what it takes to control fiscally what is going on. I had to increase audits 50% at FSSA, which I did, and had them report directly to me. I have the leadership experience to do that. The scars in the trenches, making sure we do that right, and I'll look forward to doing that at the city. A couple ideas, um, there have been some steps taken. Uh, I would immediately have asked the council and the mayor immediately to put in place a 24-7 whistleblower line John Lindemeyer had a good idea about whistleblowers at the office. I think that's good. And also having an anonymous tip line is really important. So any employee or any citizen of, this, of the city can call in and see what they see, t tell what they see going on without risk of uh, recrimination. And I think it's important, you know, the, the, um, Daryl, as, as uh, president of the city council, you got a couple briefings uh, from the state board of accounts that indicated there were problems with the TIF districts and the oversight. Uh, you and the mayor, uh, I think that action should have been taken at that time. It may have stopped the $800,000 that was stolen from the TIF accounts. Uh, I've done this before. It takes leadership. I'll also bring a team in the first 90 days to make sure if there's anything we haven't thought of that we do the right thing to control fiscal because that is really very important. Hey, thank you. Mr. Near 60 seconds. Well, you know, John, I mean, we did get those reports and we were acting on them as early as 2013 when we started to see some of those reports coming back from the State Board of Accounts. And those changes were taking place in terms of internal control, segregation of duties that Sue West, who was then controller, was putting into place. 
and those changes have continued. The financial policies plan, which was brought forward by the administration and presented to the council in conjunction with a budget, and now we're seeing the formalization of some of that plan in city code as a proposal from Mayor Cruzan and City Council Member Dave Rollo in the oversight of the Redevelopment Commission. Now, those, those processes are in place, and there's an audit currently going on within City Hall, and the State Board of Accounts is providing that. And we will see a report, and we will get an update as to how well we as a community are moving forward. There are other issues that we can do, and I think it's about public transparency and making documents available to the public, and that's something I would encourage and will pursue if elected mayor. Thank you. Mr. Lindemeyer, you have 60 seconds as well. Well, uh, democracy, I got to tell you, is in trouble all over the world. It's in trouble in America. It's in trouble in our state. And sad to say, it's in trouble in Bloomington. And uh, frankly, I think the one big reason is money. There's too darn much money in uh, politics. So when I started my campaign, I vowed that I wouldn't take any money from anybody that had anything to do with the uh, doing business with the city. I most certainly wouldn't take any money from lobbyists. Uh, I, I do appreciate that uh, Sue West has done some work on that and, and I think that's terrific. And uh, I'd, I'd like to look at all the specifics of it. I got an email from a CPA that was telling me how IU does their system and I'm telling you, you'd have a hard time it's a little clumsier, but you'd have a heck of a hard time getting uh, money out of that system. That's what we should have. Okay, Hamilton, you had a 30-second comment period. Thank you. Well, the State Board of Accounts gave two years in a row reports about the problem with the TIF districts. Uh, and, Daryl, that was the time to act uh, before the second year came in that may have helped save some of this. I, I've dealt with Board of Accounts audits. Uh, it's important to respond. Uh, at least, and to let everybody know what is happening. Uh, the, 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 the other thing I would say is it's, we only had two people who we know stole, and they're the ones who lost their jobs, but there was no other accountability, and accountability is important through the okay. whole organization. Thank you very much. And now we take a question from our studio audience, Susan snyder Salmon. Go ahead. This question focuses on the future of senior citizens in Bloomington. Apparently, our fair city is now considered a destination for retirees. Many former residents are returning to town in Monroe County, finding the tremendous opportunities attractive. And then there are the thousands of us who never left in the first place. As a member of the City of Bloomington Commission on Aging, I am interested in hearing what each candidate believes are the needs of our viable age 50 plus community, including such topics as affordable housing, access to arts and culture, medical resources, especially with the proposed hospital move, transportation, recreation, fitness, and other essential needs of our citizens in their golden years. As the next mayor of Bloomington, what will you do to support and engage this strong and essential community? Well, there are a number of areas that we can talk about uh, how we can invest in seniors who are looking to retire in Bloomington, people who have already made those choices. Uh, I think one of the areas that is very interesting in, in discussing is those seniors who are coming into our community who aren't really ready to retire, who are seeking entrepreneurial opportunities and continuing to invest in their efforts to build local businesses here in our community. Also talking about issues of affordability, we need to talk about the range of options that can be available and where those uh, affordable housing units are located and making, and making sure that we have them near our city core. Uh, talking about issues of access through community and family resources as well to be able to provide the necessary services, uh, navigating health care issues, uh, using community and family resources personnel to be able to help uh, seniors who are in need. Also, talking about public transportation, we have seen a commitment in our community to continue to invest in public transportation and expand transportation. And the hospitals moved to the bypass that was, uh, it was, a, it was a, an important move, that it, it maintains a location in our city, allowing public transit to have that connectivity uh, for people to be able to have access to health care. And I'd also raise the issues of accessibility. Um, our Americans with Disability Act transitions plan is in place to ensure that we have the infrastructure necessary to provide that necessary support. Okay, Mr. Lindemeyer. 
Well, uh, I must say I agree with practically everything you said. Well, there's nothing I disagree with. I, I would add that uh, I, I'm a little displeased with our uh, transit system. Uh, I, I wanted to, my own observation of the system is that all of the student routes were filled because they go for nothing because they pay a, a fee at the beginning of the semester. The other ones uh, were not quite as filled, and, and I got some numbers on it. Uh, let's see, here's a couple of routes that have over a million, and here's Route 8 that has 31,000. That sounds, that sounds kind of crazy to me. Uh, the idea of extending all these things uh, for a million five hundred thousand dollars for forty percent of that six hundred thousand dollars every man woman and child could ride for nothing I think we ought to work on ridership hey, first. Mr. Hamilton you get sixty seconds thank you um, well my mother-in-law and father-in-law used to visit Bloomington my mother-in-law has now moved here and enjoyed the senior center downtown on North Walnut Street uh, South Walnut Street they, uh, they enjoyed that, and we have moved that as a city. And I think that's worth thinking about because this is a great city to retire in. We welcome retirees. They, they help our city. It's a great place to have a quality of life in your senior years. Uh, but we need to make sure that Bloomington works for people regardless of their income because not all seniors retire with high incomes. Uh, and senior center is very important. This is kind of a job interview. Let me give you three quick things I would also do. One, inclusionary zoning, which really helps create affordable housing for seniors. Two, citywide community controlled broadband, which can help seniors access the healthcare system in a 21st century way. And three, integrate the bus system so we have better public transit for our seniors. They're a terrific asset, and as mayor, I'll be fully committed to making Bloomington work for all of you. Okay. Mr. Neer, you get 30 seconds to respond. Mm -hmm. The decision to relocate the senior center is in part uh, a part of the survey that Parks continues to do to get a sense of where we best need and can serve uh, the individuals in our community. And, and part of that decision is making sure that there's an integration instead of isolation of our senior population and providing opportunities throughout our community. Uh, when we talk about issues of inclusionary zoning, uh, I'm sure we'll get into more of this as well as the broadband issue here in, in further questions. Okay, thank you very much. We received several questions relating to affordable housing and the issue has been a topic, of course, you've all addressed during your campaigns. How do you plan to keep housing affordable while still meeting the demand for student and luxury apartments? Mr. Linnemeyer. Well, uh, I think uh, the idea of uh, downtown student apartments uh, actually essentially was not such a bad idea. It took the pressure off uh, neighborhoods and put students in, a, in an area where, well, put a lot of people in an area where it's uh, more uh, efficient uh, as far as police and fire and water and everything like that makes a lot of sense. The execution was, uh, was lousy, unfortunately. You see a lot of uh, really, really ugly architecture all over the downtown. And I've heard people say, well, the, you know, how can we possibly judge architecture? Well, I mean, Columbus does that. They have a, a set of, uh, of uh, okay to architects that people uh, are, are required to use. And so you build something. I mean, it doesn't take any more bricks to make a beautiful place than it does to make a, a small wood. So uh, let's see, we're talking, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of affordable housing, there's no way that a free market is going to take care of something like that because there's no money in affordable housing. So you have to intervene one way or another. Personally, I like uh, Habitat for Humanity. They do a good job. They're very cost effective. And, uh, you know, I'd like to work with things that are cost effective. Mr. Hamilton, you have 60 seconds. Thank you. Affordable housing, the first thing we need to do as a community is make a commitment to affordable housing and say we will increase it. That's the first thing. Then there are different ways to accomplish it, but that's, that's the first thing we need to do as a community and as mayor, I'll help lead that commitment. I've made that clear in my campaign. Uh, I, we do have some wonderful nonprofits like BRI and Habitat doing great work. We need to do more. Uh, I'll give you three specifics that I think uh, we ought to be doing as a city. Number one 
Inclusionary zoning is a way that anybody who's building large number of units, some percentage of them must be affordable. Burlington, Vermont did it and has 1,400 permanently affordable units in their city now. Number two, we have almost a million dollars in the housing trust fund. Eight of, eight of their board members haven't been appointed by the council or the mayor to use that money during the worst housing crisis we've had. And finally, Crawford Homes. As the president of Shalom Center, we brought in a million dollars of federal money to get 52 homeless people off the streets and it's changed their lives and helped our community. Okay, Daryl? John, it's important that we know what's going on now to be able to address these broader issues. We've got an affordable uh, housing working group that's underway with the city council looking at a variety of options. Uh, we know that the, the Senate has just sent to the governor's desk HB 1300, which will preclude us from doing a number of issues of affordable housing. And we have to look at the full range. You've talked about a permanent affordability mandate. And that, that is frightening in a number of ways because we can open up a number of opportunities. What would happen in this mandate for options like Habitat and for BRI? Those are real concerns. We also need to look at incentivization as an option. How do we take our zoning code and be able to expand it to include uh, affordability as a trade-off for increased density or parking ratios and be able to provide buyouts for people to be able to fund the housing trust fund and which, by the way, the housing trust fund language, the reason the housing trust fund hasn't worked is because HAND has a program that competes with the housing trust fund and we've had no applicants. Okay, and we're, we're rewriting we're that process, Mr. John. Mr. Lindemeyer, go ahead. You have 30 seconds to comment. Um, in terms of uh, affordable housing, I think we have had some successes. CFC has done a wonderful job of actually they had three developments. One of them was uh, the Kirkwood, rather expensive. The other were these townhouses, also very attractive. And the third one was uh, bicycle apartments. And I think they executed those well. I think we should work with outfits like that with a proven track record. Okay, we'll stick with downtown development in Bloomington. Many residents are worried that downtown will actually lose its character. But some say a city that's not growing is dying. So how do you balance that growth of downtown with those that prefer to maintain that look that makes the city's downtown what it is? And we start with uh, Mr. Hamilton with 90 seconds. Thank you. It's an excellent question. Let me just return, Daryl. Um, we don't need more study about inclusionary zoning. When you ran for council in 2011, you committed to inclusionary zoning as one of your platforms. And, and we could have had it in place over the last four years, which would have been helpful. Uh, and the housing trust fund with a million dollars, those rules are also open to change at any time by the council and to leave it unused, a million dollars that could have helped affordable housing, I think it was a mistake. We need leadership to get action. So downtown development. I stood on the corner of Walnut and Kirkwood a few weeks ago and said, one of my responsibilities as mayor is to protect this iconic view from Walnut and Kirkwood down to the sample gates for 50 years, maybe more, right? That's one of my jobs as mayor. I am very disappointed that the council and the mayor have approved effectively numerous exceedances of the 40-foot height limit on the downtown zone, including the Graduate Hotel, uh, which is, uh, has been approved uh, to be a 70-foot hotel on Kirkwood. I think that's a mistake. I think the administration and the council let those very large buildings be built downtown. It's very important to protect the aesthetic of Bloomington. I will be committed to that. I want to have local historic designation of the downtown square. I want to be sure that when we have rules like 40 foot limits that we abide by them and will as mayor, I'll be sure that happens with me and the plan commission. Okay, Daryl, 60 seconds. Well, it's, a, it's important that we acknowledge how the process works. The plan commission made the decision on the graduate hotel. The council has one appointee on that commission, and those are mayoral, appoint mayoral appointees that passed that, that, that hotel. It wasn't the council's responsibility and the, in that approval process. Uh, but what we really need to focus on is looking forward to how do we give, a sh give shape to our downtown and the rest of the community. It's going to come in the growth policies plan, which is going to be the most important, tied to our new zoning ordinances that will be in place. That will be the most important role our next mayor takes on, because those will be the fingerprints that shape our community for the next 35 years. And in doing so, 
We're, we need to be committed to increase the standards and expectations in our downtown. We're going to be designating our uh, downtown historic. That we're going to see that move forward before the end of the year. We are also going to see a draft of that growth policies plan come forward uh, sometime in August, and I encourage you all to get involved in that process. It's important for full Thank community you. engagement. Mr. Linnemeyer, you get 60 seconds, please. Okay, uh, first off, I definitely uh, approve the idea of uh, keeping the uh, the square. Uh, it's very interesting architecturally. Uh, one thing that troubles me a lot is these little businesses like Max's, Caveat Emptor, uh, the yarn store, places like that, they're going broke because of these daggone uh, meters. And it, it makes me sore that there was so little uh, uh, actual conversation with these people. You know, personally, I'd like to, I'd like to yank every, uh, every um, parking meter out of the city, but I won't do it if people disagree with me, you know. And uh, I'd, I'd like to turn uh, Fifth Street into a walking street. But if I talk to Michael Cassidy at the Uptown and I talk to Dave and Larry at the uh, pizzeria and they say, look, Lenamar, it's a bad idea, then I'll go, okay, all right, we'll try something else. 30 seconds, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. You know, Darrell, the council passed the 40-foot height limit as part of the ordinances governing the city. Multiple times, the, the administration and the, and the plan commission approved exceedances of those, offering waivers, and the council did not take any action to respond to that. As a council leader, if you see something happening that's going against the law that you passed, you need to take leadership to say, this is wrong. I would have done that. The graduate is a mistake. Time's up. And we should Time's do. up. Sorry. Thank you. We head to the audience now for another question, this time Sandy Clark. Good evening. Assuming that an organization is stronger when it includes diverse voices and a range of opinions, what voices do you think city government needs more of and how would you go about bringing this represent representation into your administration? And also, please speak to how you personally stay in touch with diverse uh, points of view and perspectives. With yeah. what points of view? Diverse points of view and perspectives. Mr. Nair, you begin with nine. I think the fundamental starting point is creating a culture of engagement within City Hall and it's a commitment to keeping those lines of communication between the mayor's office and a variety of groups within our community open. And, and that's broadly considered. Certainly you have institutions that we need to reestablish strong communication with, relationships with, IU uh, and, and Monroe County government, I think are, are two important ones. But we also have to be more actively engaged directly with the commissions who are representing our community. And that's with our seniors, that's with our Hispanic and Latino affairs, that's with, our, with reaching out to the African American community, it's reaching out to our small business community. And creating working groups that work directly with the mayor's office is a, an, a, an easy step to put into place to ensure that that engagement continues. Now, one of the, one of the ways that, that I've been committed to making sure that I'm reaching out to people is when we deal with legislation, whether it be about District 5, which I represent now, or other issues, when we have stakeholders engaging the stakeholders in those conversations on the issues that are before council. It's an important consideration to bring those, those individual viewpoints to play and bear out how we develop policy for the city. And it's a commitment that I will continue uh, if and when I'm elected mayor. Thank you, Mr. Linnemeyer. 60 seconds. Well, sometimes people ask me, well, what would you do with the, the you know, when the hospital moves, what would you do uh, with Switchyard Parks and so forth? Uh, I, uh, these things actually are, in a way, structural situations. Like I know darn well that every person in here, if you put all of your ideas together, they would be so much better than my best idea or, or uh, either these two gentlemen. Well, okay, I can't speak for Daryl. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, uh, so I think you have to have a structure where everybody is heard. You know, not just the high and the mighty and so forth, but uh, uh, regular people, you know, I, uh, as far as uh, how this uh, uh, hospital move is going to be handled and so forth, if it's, if it's just, 
Though I will say it's a pretty good job Cruzan did with that committee, but I think other voices need to be okay. blah, blah. Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. It's a lesson I learned uh, actually when I was assembling teams to lead large state agencies where you have to bring together the strongest group that you can when I ran the environmental agency for the state or the social services agency. And it was actually a very powerful message that you really need voices that disagree with you. Seriously, bring different viewpoints together. You are much stronger uh, as an organization, as a team, when that is true. So it's a great question. It's absolutely true in the city. One thing I'll be sure to do specifically is to hold weekly meetings as mayor and as my cabinet officials will be publicly available for everybody to come and talk to the mayor, to the head of the sanitation department, head of the streets department, head of the parks department at different times to make that available. Having the full range of our race, racial diversity, LGBTQ community is really important. Personally, I've been to 55 house parties and I heard from a lot of you. Diverse viewpoints, you don't all agree and that makes us better. Okay, Mr. Neer, 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I would highlight what some of the major projects that have been moving forward in recent years, um, such as the uh, Switchyard Park, uh, the Certified Tech Park, and the Homelessness Charrettes. Those were examples of local government going to the people, pulling in stakeholders to get their voices involved to shape these projects. And that's an important framework from which we should continue as a local government. When there are projects being developed, pull people in so it tr they truly become a community project. Okay, thank you. We've received questions regarding your personal experience. Uh, two different angles here. James Boyd wants to know if you have the managerial and, and administrative experience to run the city. Charlotte Zitlow takes it a different way and wants to, wants to know how you would approach your job as mayor. So we start uh, 90 seconds with Mr. Linnemeyer. Well, I, I actually would take a quite a bit different style, you might say, of uh, government. I'd be uh, more of a chairman of the board type, and I'd make sure that I had the smartest deputy mayor you ever saw. And I would uh, I'd consult with uh, uh, these uh, uh, incredible uh, people, you know, there's some things I wouldn't do without talking to Tom Makuta. There's some things I wouldn't do without talking to Rick uh, uh, Dietz. I, I think this idea that you have the vision and nobody else does is just wrong, you know. You have to, I've seen so many times when people have made decisions ahead of time, you know. Uh, we've already decided that, uh, you know, these parking meters are going in. And, uh, you know, it's, it, this is out of your hands because we have decided it. Me and the uh, uh, parking meter uh, companies are, that were selling these things, we've already decided what you need. And now you can talk as much as you want to, but we're not listening to it. I think you have to be willing to change your mind if somebody has a better idea. One thing I like about the way this campaign has been is we've all stolen each other's ideas, and I think that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, I mean, you guys have had some marvelous ideas, and I've, I've uh, yeah, I'll eat them up. Sure, why not? <laughs> okay, Mr. Hamilton. Managerial experience is important. We've seen that our city has lacked some fiscal controls. Um, I am proud that Governor O'Bannon, a long-time serving Democratic governor in the state, asked me to run the state environmental agency in his first term. We won awards in that agency, including, for example, for protecting kids from toxics. I believe leaders need to show results. Child care centers all across the state. In his second term, Governor O'Bannon asked me to run what many consider a, a very difficult agency to run. It was a challenge. It was 10,000 employees. It's the social safety net for the state. I'm proud to have done that and to assemble the team to do things. We also won awards there, for example, for uh, uh, getting people on welfare into jobs. Or we set goals that we achieved. For example, we said we want 4,000 more seniors in one year to be able to stay at home rather than get pushed into a nursing home. That's important. Engagement uh, is critical. I have the experience to do that, and I know I can bring a good team together downtown okay. to help. Mr. Neer. The key here is being able to organize a team that can lead our city, 
no one up here can run a sanitation department. We don't know the specifics of how to do it. We don't know how to pave roads. So it's important that we identify the key talent to surround ourselves with to be able to empower our frontline employees to do their jobs, do their jobs well, and to empower them to innovate. And it's that type of culture that I want to be able to facilitate and build within City Hall. And that means picking a, a deputy mayor that is strong as well that can help in this process. Now, at the core, what is leadership about? It's about managing and inspiring people. And I've been doing that my entire life in classrooms and identifying kids who have talent, helping them get better, and finding them places where they can find successful careers. It's taking those skills and working with Fortune 50 companies and doing leadership assessment and development work so they can have the okay. talent necessary right, for them to you. succeed. Mr. Lindemeyer, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I've uh, run uh, companies and uh, my, my company, Flying Fish Painting, I'll tell you, people who had better paying jobs would quit in the springtime because they knew Lindemeyer was hiring and it was going to be interesting, it was going to be fun, it was going to be challenging. And uh, I think I know how to do that. Uh, I know darn well I, I could. I can remember being in organizations where I was grinding my guts and I thought, I can do better than this. Okay. Ben Planton has the next question and he is with us here in the studio. We have a growing crisis here in Bloomington, and that is a lack of high quality infant toddler care. As mayor, what would you do to ensure those wanting to raise families in Bloomington have access to affordable care for their children? And Mr. Hamilton, you begin 90 seconds. That's a great question. Thank you very much. My wife and I have faced that ourselves when we had to look for infant and toddler care in the city. One of the things I think a mayor can do, there, that's a big challenge for the country to look at how do we increase uh, the, the early childhood and it's, it's, so we're not unique in Bloomington to have that. We certainly want to support the Head Start programs, uh, make sure we do all we can with that. And one of the things a mayor can do is also try to help bring in more support to the city. Just as an example of that, I, I mentioned very briefly the, the care for people who are homeless that we did with uh, Crawford Homes, where we reached out as a community, Life Designs in Shalom, and brought in a million dollars more federal money to help those folks uh, who needed it. Uh, we've also brought in new federal money to help families with children uh, who have uh, homeless families with children to help them get into apartments. I just heard tonight that about 50 kids over the last year have been helped get into housing uh, with that kind of federal support. So one of the things I look forward to doing as mayor is helping use the 30, 30 plus years uh, of experience in progressive politics and issues around this city and around this state to help find those resources. Uh, we have terrific people doing that kind of work in the city. We need more resources to support them, to give them better wages so that we can get more high quality child care. Okay. Darrell, 60 seconds. I mean, the the focus point, if you're looking for direct help within City Hall, I think where we can tap resources is, com is our Community and Family Resources uh, Office and looking to them uh, for help as a centerpiece to be able to develop and identify programs that can work. But this is also a broader issue. It gets to the issues in talking about economic development and how we create economic vitality and in increasing not just our, our, our wage growth, but how do we close the wage gap and wait, raise our wage floor? And that's an important challenge that all of us, if, if, if elected, we're going to have to deal with. And it's going to be a, an important part in being able to provide access, additional income to be able to pay for health care, or child care, excuse me. And also issues of affordability. We get back into talking about how can we make uh, our community more affordable to families, working families who are looking for rental units or their first homes, and those strategies go back to how we develop out our development ordinance. Okay, Mr. Linnemeyer. Well, uh, I can remember one time uh, back in the day when I worked in a daycare center in uh, Germany for the Air Force, and uh, I always, uh, it was terribly paid. It was paid uh, absolutely as low as you can possibly get. But I, I always considered it, it, if the pay was bad or not, I thought, well, this is a very important job. Uh, so uh, I, 
I don't, I, I don't want to give you any jive here. It's something that I haven't uh, studied a great deal. And uh, I, I like some of the ideas that, uh, that uh, John and Daryl have mentioned here, but, but I don't want to throw out a bunch of ideas uh, just shooting from the hip. I'd have to study it more. But it's a darn good question. All right, thank you. Uh, John, you have 30 seconds if you'd like. As a country, we have a serious problem with income disparity and even worse with wealth disparity. Uh, and that is one of the causes of uh, the, the, the lack of child care access. Uh, so I think it is right that we need to work on that. I announced a few weeks ago, this is, a, this is not an easy thing to do, but I want to bring together for six months at the beginning of my administration the best people we can find in the university, outside the university, the best that we can find to help. How do we raise wages? How do we deal with these issues of health care, wages, affordable okay. housing, jobs? Thank you. Time's Thanks. up. And we're, we're getting down there, and we're getting a lot of questions coming in, so we're going to change the format now to uh, 30 seconds just to try to get a few more in. Um, this one is, is actually from an email. Uh, our, this question is from Sarah Perfetti. She says the recent action, actions at the state capitol with the signing of RIFRA was very disappointing. What specific actions would you take to ensure Bloomington is safe, inclusive city for the queer community, especially the LGBTQ youth? I jumped in immediately and, and helped the, our city council draft a, a ordinance or a resolution that spoke out against RIFRA and it was an important statement of our city to stand strong uh, against the hate that was coming out through that, that piece of legislation. Um, but one of the key ways that I think that we can address issues is it's time to update our human rights ordinance, making sure that we're strengthening its commitment to all groups, including our LGBT community, including LGBTQ teens who are suffering, still suffering, okay. bullying at the hands of others. Mr. Linda Meyer. Well, one thing that really uh, made me proud of, uh, of our little town is uh, when this riprop uh, jive came in, uh, all three of us were out there. There wasn't any question. There was total solidarity. Uh, we all hit it from a different angle, but, uh, you know, I, I was thinking, why don't we all get up here and link arms and say, hey, not in our town. This is, this is a land of where you can be whatever you darn well please, and, you know. That's what Bloomington's all about. Okay, Mr. Hamilton. We are indeed, John. That's a good point. Uh, I would say three specific things. One, I think as a, as a mayor, uh, I will link arms with the other cities around the state, too, to say this is not happening. This should not happen in Indiana. And all the cities will come together, I think, strongly to say, leave us alone. In fact, pass a statewide human rights ordinance, and we can advocate for that, I will. A second thing, I do think strengthening our local human rights ordinance. And third, support places like Rhinos, where youth can be in a very safe place. Okay. It's a and terrific asset. Darrell, you get a 30 second as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's collaboration across the state. It's an issue that it cuts across issues. Um, I attended the Indiana Association of Cities and Towns meeting, a legislative session in Indianapolis, and talked to mayors. And regardless of their political party, what I heard consistently was it were issues that we all shared, we were all concerned about. And how can we better collaborate across the state to make those efforts? I agree with John wholeheartedly. Um, those, those issues cross across party lines, and we can come together. Okay, as many people know, Bloomington was once home to Westinghouse Electric Corporation, which left behind PCB. It's a chemical many believe is hazardous. We had several people write in to ask, would you take action to remove remaining PCBs from the city? And if so, how would you go about it? Mr. Linnemeyer, you begin first. Okay, let me shoot myself in the foot here. I know a lot of people disagree with me, but uh, there, there were court cases on this, and then... Uh, Statistically, there weren't, uh, there weren't higher incidences. You can spend billions of dollars on these kind of things. And as I say, <laughs> there you go. I'm in hot water, but I don't care. <laughs> Mr. Hamilton? I was involved at the Department of Environmental Management about the first uh, consent decree getting in place. And we said, you know, this is the kindergarten rule. If you make the mess, you clean it up. We didn't have to pay for it, we the city. This is paid for by Westinghouse and the successors who bought it. And absolutely, I will do whatever is necessary to make sure this city, our environment, is protected and clean. One of the first things we need to do is make sure all the information is available. 
I want the government to be completely open. If there's any question about measurable detection, uh, it should be okay. available publicly. Thank you. Daryl? We should be ensuring that we're fulfilling our obligation not only on PCB-related issues, but water quality issues as well. And, and in doing so, it's also providing and empowering uh, our environmental commissions uh, and other boards and commissions like the Sustainability Commission with the resources necessary to help them do their jobs. I think that's, a, that's an important consideration uh, when we look at what we can ac achieve with those groups. Um, and as well, uh, trying to make sure that we do allow for the okay. broader... We're up. Sorry. <laughs> quick. But Mr. Lindemeyer, you get 30 seconds. Stop. 30 seconds on it. Okay. Uh, you know, like I say, I'm just going to tell you what I think. If you don't like it, that's okay. Don't vote for me. Uh, I think I believe in, in numbers. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I was in Vietnam. I know there, uh, you know, we might have been able to get a little money for uh, Agent Orange, but the numbers were not there. I'm sorry. They studied people in Germany. They studied people in Vietnam. I was even part of this study. And the numbers were not there, and so okay. that's it. And now we are going to, um, we, we've received a number of questions about jobs. What are your plans to promote the city and incentive new companies to the area or expand existing ones? And I believe, where are we at? Hamilton. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. I, that's, that's, thank you very much. This is a really, really important question for us. We have lost a lot of good jobs. 30 seconds is not very long. I have advocated that the city needs, and I will lead the city to get, citywide, community-controlled, high-speed broadband internet. It's happening across the country. We can do it in Bloomington. There are different ways to do it, but it is important that we do this. This is for the 21st century jobs and education and health care. Uh, Jasper's doing it in one way. Auburn's doing it in another way, and we can do it. I look forward to that. I think that'll be a real job creator. Mr. Neer. Our economic vitality is connected to our quality of life and that creation of sense and place, and that's where, that's where it all begins. We have been able to create a community that is attractive through the commitment to the infrastructure that we've built out, the Beeline Trail, the parks, our commitment to the culture and the arts, and to the social services. Certified Tech Park is going to be an important component of our economic development uh, strategy because it will be a centerpiece for the next generation of business leaders in our community. But we also have to invest in job training as well okay. so we get people uh, prepared for Mr. those Lundemeyer. jobs. Well, I, I uh, also agree that this uh, municipally owned uh, fiber optic uh, system, uh, there's nothing we could do that would help be more helpful than that. Uh, it's going to be one heck of a lot harder than some people think. The people I talk to is, uh, have gone into great detail about how tricky it's going to be, how tricky it's going to be politically also. And I'll have to say, uh, when uh, John and I were waxing poetic about it, uh, old Daryl here actually came okay. in and started talking we're, about the problems. So the problems. Thank you. All right, where are we? Do I rebut? Yes, 30 seconds, Thank Hamilton. Thank, Thank you. you. Go Thank ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we can do this. Uh, communities are doing it. It is not simple, but we have a public utility water that can be used to do this. We can do it with the electric company. This is really important for our community. We have one of the best informatics schools in the country, the world, here. We have people who want to live here, and gigabit speed internet up and down is really important. I do not want to wait. Daryl, this is a difference between us. You thought AT&T and Comcast were bringing sufficient services to people. I do not think they are. I think our community's future depends upon us grabbing hold of this and making it happen. Okay. This is our last question. It's an email question from Jeffrey Huntsman. How will you support the arts in Bloomington? When the Buzzkirk Chumley Theater was established, continuing city support was promised. Will your administration continue to honor this pledge? Mr. Neer, you begin. Straightforward. The answer is yes. When there was a question whether or not that funding would be here in the last budget rounds, uh, Councilmember Bolin and I fought to ensure that those dollars would be available to Bud's Creek Chumley Theater, and we will continue that commitment uh, in my administration. I also believe we need to collaborate with Indiana University. We need to do uh, an infrastructure assessment and looking, do we have adequate spaces available, gallery space, theater space? Is it, is it adequately utilized? How can we have further investment? And, and those are two key areas that we can, we can tackle. Okay, Mr. Lindemeyer. 
Yeah, I I, uh, uh, I think that uh, I mean arts for their for their own sake are wonderful. It's uh, one of the joys of civilization to be able to listen to beautiful music and and the arts and so forth. But also they uh, they actually even make economic sense. You know, they're one of the reasons why people want to come here. Uh, if you put that together with uh, the freedom to live your own life, you know, go smoke a joint if you feel like it. And All right, Hamilton, 30 seconds. Thank you very much. The arts are essential. My wife and I are kids. We love the arts. We attend them very frequently. Um, absolutely support the bus, Kirk Chumley. I think maybe we ought to consider trying to get some more festivals like 4th Street uh, Arts Fair and, and Lotus and maybe some more major festivals like that. Now I will say one thing, fiscally we have to be able to have the money to pay for it. I am concerned about the city looking at a 40 plus million dollar bond issue in the next two months without discussion about that. We have to control our finances to f fund the arts too. Mr. Neer, you get 30 seconds. One of the other areas when we consider the arts, we need to make sure that we have consistent funding streams in, in three key areas being able to have economic funding uh, stream for artists who have projects that can be invested in, small grants are made available, have uh, funding available for infrastructure improvements, uh, capital investments is another key piece of, of commitment to our arts community, as well as the third, commitment to dollars that for the arts promotion, for those events and those organizations who work hard in this community to promote arts, to bring theater to okay. us, to bring music. Time's up, invest thank in you. That promotion. And now we end with our closing statements and we begin with Mr. Hamilton. You may begin. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention tonight uh, and, and your attention to the campaign. This is kind of like a long job interview uh, and I appreciate you, you considering it that way. Looking at our record, I have my local commitment through the school board and through the sustainability commission and the Shalom board. I'm very proud to have the support of the firefighters of the city and, and AFSCME uh, representing hundreds of employees of the city who are looking for new leadership and have supported me. Uh, I do believe I'm a tested leader. I've had to negotiate with corporations who didn't want to play by the same rules as other folks, make them clean up their pollution. I've managed thousands of employees setting public goals and achieving them together like getting more people off of welfare uh, into work. And I've enforced fiscal controls to protect against theft by increasing audits, having them report to me by 50%, saving, hundreds of mil saving millions of dollars and reducing an error rate from 13% to 2% at Medicaid. I also am proud to have helped create jobs uh, with a, a nonprofit and a community lending organization I started that now employ 50 people. Uh, and support hundreds of jobs in low wealth uh, neighborhoods. Now, you look at what we've done and you look at how we've campaigned. I've had 55 house parties. I'll answer any questions you have. I look forward to that. Please keep them coming. You can look up my record online. I've been in the public eye before. Uh, I'm proud to have stuck to my pledges uh, on corporate contributions. All three of us said we would not accept corporate contributions, and John, you haven't. Daryl, you have. Uh, you, you pledged you would not, but you took $1,000 from corporate contributions. I've turned them down. I know John has as well. And the campaign is about the future, the specific ideas about how to move forward. Affordable housing, Bloomington broadband, public schools, and open accountable government. We have a fantastic city. We have a great future ahead of us. It is not automatic. But I look forward to working together with you to make it happen. Thanks for your vote anytime between now and May 5th for John Hamilton. All right, Mr. Neer, two minutes. Well, you know, John, um, I, I, I'll happily accept the, the corporate donation I did from the Comedy Attic. Uh, I don't think that's the kind of money we're talking about keeping out of government. Um, but I would take a look at uh, where other dollars are coming from, and I'll stand by my fundraising record during this campaign. Uh, we love Bloomington. We all love Bloomington. It's a great city, and we are doing well in so many different ways. We have an envi enviable quality of life, a unique and quirky character, abundant natural and cultural resources with breath breathtaking natural spaces that define South Central Indiana, and it's a city loved by tens of thousands of people around the country. And we are a regional economic center, a regional arts and culture center, and a regional so social services center. But we can do better. And we will do better. And I commit, and you can take a look at that long history that I do have in this community, 24 years, and those different lives, different perspectives that I bring to this office. I've been invested in understanding the issues through my public affairs program, programming commitment to understand how local, local government works. 
I've got a legislative record on city council that I am proud of, that you can take a look at what we've been able to deliver. Um, and I'd also point to the strong support that I've received throughout this campaign. Now, Mayor Mark Cruzan, Representative Matt Pierce, former uh, Democratic Party Chair and City Clerk Pat Williams, Vi Judge Val Vitalia Farrow, and Charlotte Zitlow. They've all recognized the skills and the abilities that I've been able to demonstrate in office and that I had before entering office. And their support means a lot, and I will work hard to earn your support throughout the rest of this campaign and earn your vote on May 5th. So thank you very much for watching tonight. All right, thank you. And Mr. Linnemeyer, you have two-minute closing statement. Okay, I entered this race because I felt that there were things that were not being said and things that would uh, not be done if I, if I weren't in it. I, 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 at bottom, though, I, I did it to, uh, to serve my, my community, to serve Bloomington. Um, I, frankly, I think I'd be the best mayor this town's ever seen, but... I'm not going to win. I can see that right now, and I'm a pragmatic guy, so I'm going to drop out. I don't want to be a Ralph Nader. Uh, but like I say, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in Bloomington. I, this is the town that I love. I'm, I know we all say that, but anyway. Okay, uh, over the course of a canteen, you get to see people in all kinds of uh, situations, and you can begin to take their measure. And uh, I'd just like to say, uh, Mr. Hamilton, he's a fine man, he's a gentleman, very intelligent. He's got all kinds of experience running large bureaucracies. But I've got a couple of reservations. I, I, I didn't like that he started the arms war raising money, and I most certainly don't like that he took uh, lobbyist money from D.C. I've seen Mr. Nair here. And he, I've seen him uh, say things that other people didn't want to hear. And like me, he's a pr pragmatic guy. And on city council, those people knew him. And there was a reason why they voted for him as president. I see those things now. And I have over the course of the campaign. He's not just a nice guy. He's a leader, consensus builder, and I think he's got the right stuff. To my uh, supporters, Thanks so much. I love you. And uh, I, I do think that we uh, got some things out there that wouldn't have been said otherwise. Okay. And thank you very much to the candidates. And thank you for joining us this evening. Before you vote May 5th, join us for more election coverage at indianapublicmedia.org. Have a good night. Support for this program comes from our members. Thank you.